Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes a pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Episode 91 of the Last Round Podcast, a redo. We just, uh, we tried this first for the first couple minutes, uh, and then we uh, ran into some technical difficulties, so this is a repeat. Uh, You know, we want to be as transparent as we can uh, (laughs) to our listeners, so, you know, we want to make sure the audio quality and everything is as great as, you know, uh, as good as it can be, Um, you know, like everybody else out there, uh, we are also trying to adjust to this pandemic covid era um you know especially with our audio quality and all that stuff delivering content for everybody uh boxing content obviously during this uh difficult time for everybody that hopefully hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel right mike hopefully hopefully it looks like we're kind of getting closer towards that uh that light at the end of the tunnel you know obviously matchroom was coming back pbc golden boy's done a show top rank's been back for a while so um, fingers crossed we're, you know, obviously going in the right direction. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. And, uh, you know, that's all we can we can do at the moment. Um, but, you know, jumping right into it. Um, watching If you're watching the broadcast, like I mentioned the first time, uh, you can obviously see who we have. Um, he's promoted the likes of the Klitschko's, uh, Chocolatito Gonzalez, um, who, in my opinion, I think it, I think it's cool to see that he's coming back in the fold. Absolutely. No, I think I think it's great because you know uh, I, it, he he we did go through a uh, a streak of, of some unfortunate losses the last you know couple of years ago, but now he's back in the fold and back in back at the top of the game there. He's, um, a, champion. he's a champion again. He's a, he's a champion again. Yeah. Um, but like you said, like I said, you promoted Chocolatito Gonzalez, uh, the great Triple G Gennady, Gennady Golovkin, the former unified middleweight champion of the world. Yeah. Uh, you've worked a lot alongside the management team of Sugar Shane Mosley, yeah. um, the great Sugar Shane Mosley, obviously. And then also, you also the, you're also the head of uh, 360 uh, Promotions, um, which I would say your home base is uh, the, at the Avalon, right in in Hollywood, California. That's been where. Um, I think all of all of your shows have been right, Tom. Yeah, well, we've done some other 360 shows on uh, HBO, but uh, right. that's where we really develop uh, the fighters as a uh, local show out here in LA to develop talent. We've had Surya Bowachuk fight there a number of times. Uh, Brian Sabayo out of New York has mm-hmm. fought there before. Uh, we just had Adrian Montoya uh, on the show, so it, it's a fun experience there at the Avalon in Hollywood. It's called uh, Hollywood Fight Nights. Right. Unfortunately, that's on on hold because uh, there's no live uh, no live ticket gate. But we're, we're we're working on a solution to bring back uh, the Hollywood Fight Night show on a on a platform that can be uh, uh, promoted without without having the the live fan base the live fan base there. Tom, it, does it make you feel? Uh... You know, like you really achieved something when people like Joshua Franco, who would have been on those Hollywood fight night shows, you know, you do that obviously to try and get people of that stature up, you know, to maximize their potential. And obviously, you know, he went away to Vegas, the B side and won the, the world title. So how does that make you feel? Yeah. Uh, no, it's great. And, uh, um, you know, that, that's really what that platform is for, is to develop talent, to take them to the next level. Uh, I really think Surrey Boachuk, he's 17-0 and with 17 knockouts. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm convinced that he'll become a world champion. He's a super welterweight, um, and uh, he's in the ratings now. And, and uh, you know, guys like that, Brian Ceballo has a, a ton of potential, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. also Adrian Montoya. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it, it's a great launching pad, and it's nice to see when they go from that platform onto the, the, the bigger stage. Um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's definitely exciting. Like, uh, Sabayo fought on the Triple G shows in Madison Square Garden last year, and uh, a lot of times when guys go from the smaller shows to a big arena like that under the big spotlights on a huge show, they'll freeze under the spotlight. And uh, he knew he had to have uh, 
very difficult fights in order to get on that show. And, and he, uh, that really brought out the best of him, the talent uh, that he was able to display in the ring there at Madison Square Garden. He sold a lot of tickets. Uh, he's local there in New York, and uh, that's a huge part of a developing fighter's uh, career is uh, marketability, ticket sales, and, and we were really pleased with his, uh, his performances. Tom, you mentioned, you know, obviously that, that, you know, during the pandemic era, there's no live ticket gate, you know, there's no fans, obviously. So that's obviously a big chunk of, of, uh, of income, you know, for promoters and, and, and in general that, that's not coming in. Yeah. Um, you know, now that kind of boxing is pretty much getting into the swing of things, at least bringing back fights, you know, like Mike mentioned, Matchroom uh, just, just started their, their roller coaster going forward uh, with Eddie Hearn's, uh, you know, backyard fights. And then Golden Boy just came back with Virgil Ortiz. Uh, PBC just announced um, some fights in the, on Showtime, and then I think Fox is coming up as well. Yep. Um, you know, I know you said with that, you know, that you're looking into how to come back, and you're kind of in, in, in potential talks with different maybe platforms and stuff like that. I mean, is there anything that you can kind of you know forecast for the fans in terms of th- the 360 promotions, especially you know, are you st- are you talking to the Avalon maybe to try to bring some fights there during this pandemic era? Avalon's going to be tough because uh, of the restrictions here in California, especially in Los Angeles uh, for indoor uh, events. So uh, Avalon will be tough, but uh, the show that we had scheduled uh, right after the pandemic hit uh, March 29th was a tremendous show. That was actually going to be on UFC Fight Pass. So uh, we're, we're looking into doing another show on Fight Pass without the fans uh naturally financially it'd be a lot different uh but you know we'll see we just want to keep the guys busy and uh, keep the brand uh, going but um you know right now uh you know as you said we're getting used to all the different uh, challenges and we had the technical difficulty before hope you guys can hear me better now but we're really looking forward to uh cecilia break who's fighting august 15th um you know, you mentioned uh, Eddie had a great show. Uh, he had a tremendous setup there with Sky Sports and the Zone USA uh, in his, uh, really in his backyard uh, <laughs> of the house he grew up in. And uh, I think they did a tremendous job there. Top rank, you know, kind of uh, broke, uh, was the first one, first major promoter uh, doing the shows on ESPN. There were a lot of challenges there. Uh, we definitely, uh, you know, we, we helped uh, uh, with a couple of fighters on, uh, for their shows because they were really scrambling on, uh, you know, either boxers weren't ready because the gyms were closed or uh, there were some positive tests. And, um, you know, so we're happy to see top rank come back. Like you said, the showtime and uh, the PBC have uh, announced really a full slate of, uh, mm-hmm. of shows. So it's just fun. And it's nice to see uh, boxing is back. Golden boy did their show. You know, I have a good relationship with all the promoters and, and I like to support all the different shows. Um, so it's it, it's a welcome change for Boxing Be Back, even if it's without the fans. I mean, the Tulsa show is going to be interesting. It's actually an outdoor event mm-hmm. with no uh, fans and all the different uh, testing that's going to be done. And then the quarantine once you arrive to make sure that nothing. First, you have to get a test before you uh, get on the plane. Then you have to get it. You have to be quarantined for uh, 48 hours to make sure while you were flying, whether it's at the airport or on the plane, that you didn't uh, get exposed to the virus and you're in the, in the room the entire time they bring the food to you. And, uh, you know, it's it's definitely a different circumstance. And, and what I would say is, you know, it's going to be challenging for fighters. You know, fighters that are used to running in the mornings, going outside, uh, maybe going into a steam room or a sauna or whatever, if they need to lose weight or if they have to have a special diet, and now you're under a completely different uh, restriction as to what you're able to do in order to prepare during fight week. So uh, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot different fight week than uh, than we've ever seen uh, before. Tom, you could uh, you could go one better than Eddie, and you could hold the fights actually in your house, like in, <laughs> like in your kitchen, in your living room. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if the living room's big enough to uh, put the boxing <laughs> ring, but uh, yeah, no. Like I said, I, I support all the promoters. I'm I'm just happy uh, th- to see boxing back. Uh, you know, getting back to Cecilia, um, she's broken so many records and uh, accomplished so much in her career. Uh, this will be she'll be the first woman ever to headline the zone, uh, which is uh, tremendous. She's the undisputed welterweight uh, champion. Uh, 
She holds the three Guinness Book of World Records. She's Ring Magazine's pound for pound uh, female champion. She actually got boxing legalized in her home country of Norway. It was banned for 35 years, if you can imagine. And she spearheaded the, the movement for professional boxing to get back to Norway because she was a she was a world champion and she could fight anywhere in the world except for her home country. So because of that, that was a big push to get boxing legalized. She uh, she fought on pay-per-view there in Norway. She's very successful, very popular. In Norway, she sold out a 10,000 seat arena uh, there in Oslo. And uh, uh, if she can be successful against Jessica McCaskill, which is not an easy task. Jessica McCaskill is a world champion at 140 pounds. They've agreed to meet at 145 pounds uh, which is very difficult to do to put uh, two world champions together to make a fight like that. And uh, you got to give a lot of credit to Cecilia and Jessica to make that happen. Kitty Taylor's fighting a week later, August 27th, uh, 22nd, again in Eddie's, uh, Eddie's fight camp. So if Cecilia is successful, if Kitty's successful, that would be a huge fight. But you can't un overlook uh, Jessica McCaskill because she gave Kitty Taylor a very tough fight. And we know she's coming. Uh, and she wants to uh, win uh, Cecilia's title. So we're, we're excited for uh, August 15th, the Zone USA uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tommy, it kind of looks like you've got a, like a little tournament going on with you know, Cecilia and Jessica, the winner, more than likely fighting Katie Taylor or Delphine Pastoon. Have, have you discussed with Eddie and the girls about um, you know, what weight category it will be at? Will it be at, at a catch weight? Uh, it would be a catch weight, yeah, uh, because uh, from my understanding is they're fighting at 135, uh, the fight with Katie and uh, Delphine Pursun, which is not an easy fight for Katie either. Uh, mm -hmm. Delphine Pursun gave her all she could handle uh, uh, when they fought the first time, and for her to do the rematch, you got to give a lot of credit. I know people were looking forward to Amanda Serrano, uh, but for whatever reason, that fight fell apart. Uh, I saw some of the back and forth on social media, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, having Dauphine Pursun in a rematch is a tremendous fight with uh, Katie. But uh, that's really the goal. And that was uh, one of the big reasons uh, that uh, Cecilia signed with Matchroom is uh, uh, to, to go in that direction. And, and I think if they both win and if they fight each other, that would definitely be the biggest fight in uh, women's boxing history. Uh, and it would be, a, to go back to your original questions, it would be a, a, a catch weight because... Uh, Katie's moving up, Cecilia's moving down, and, and we'd have to figure out what the what the weight would be there. Do you think that would take women's boxing to another level, just with the the promotion? I think absolutely. Uh, when you got two popular fighters, uh, and, and don't forget, you know these, these are international, internationally popular fighters. Uh, like I said, Cecilia is extremely popular in Europe. She's wanted to come over here. Uh, to the States after being so successful in Norway, like I said, selling out 10,000 seat arenas and then uh, coming over here and really just sacrificing to be on HBO at the time. She broke the, uh, the glass ceiling on HBO at 45 year history of HBO. And they've never had a female uh, championship fight on uh, actually there hasn't been any female fight on uh, HBO in a 45 year history. Um, I got to give uh, Peter Nelson a lot of credit for his foresight foresight. Uh, he's the one that really uh, opened the door for Triple G to be on the network, and he became really one of their most popular stars on HBO. He's the one that greenlit uh, Chapatito Gonzalez to be on the show, which they hadn't had a flyweight on HBO for, uh, for a number of years, you know, they, they, uh, the lighter weights, and that's how we came up with the Superfly series, uh, which was extremely popular. And uh, Got to give him credit for putting, uh, for allowing Cecilia to fight on the network and then headlining her own show. So Cecilia, as of now, would be the only fighter in uh, boxing history to headline both HBO and uh, the Zone on uh, August fifteenth. Cecilia's had a rocky style camp up in Big Bear, and I think now because of the first fight being cancelled, she's been in Big Bear by herself for about six months. Since January, yeah. Ooh. So it'll actually be seven months. Uh, she was originally supposed to fight Jessica McCaskill August 17th, uh, April 17th. And uh, so that got pushed back now to August 15th. Uh, and, and we were really uh, telling Eddie and Frank that, uh, you know, she's been in camp for so long. You know, it's actually smart that she stayed in camp for a number of reasons. First, she's completely isolated up there in Big Bear. It's a private gym. Uh, it's Abel Sanchez's summit gym. So she actually lives uh, there at the gym. She's not going out 
driving around and during this whole pandemic, you know, she was about as safe as anyone could be because Big Bear at that time was, uh, you know, pretty isolated to start with. And then just being in the gym, uh, living in the gym, uh, he's got two houses up there and, and, uh, and that worked out well for her. But secondly, if she had gone back to Norway, uh, most likely she wouldn't have been able to get back in in time. Uh, to start training because the travel ban between the U.S. and, and Europe. So uh, she made the sacrifice, as many champions do, that are serious about their career. And uh, luckily, uh, she was able to come back on the first uh, show here for uh, DAZN USA and match from here in the United States. And uh, as luck would have it, now she's headlining that show. So we're really excited about that fight. Was there any reason behind the changing coach from Jonathan Banks to Abel Sanchez? Well, Jonathan, uh, I have to give him a lot of credit. Uh, he, uh, when when Cecilia uh, left Sauerland Promotion, when the contract was up, uh, Vladimir Klitschko pretty much took her under his wing because uh, they had known each other from, uh, uh, from Germany. And uh, he took her under his wing, really supported her, allowed her to train in his training camp up in the Austrian Alps. Uh, and uh, put her together with Jonathan Banks, his trainer, you know, after Emmanuel Stewart, unfortunately, had passed away. Jonathan Banks had taken over uh, training Vladimir Klitschko. And so Jonathan had also worked with uh, Cecilia, and they got along really well. I think Jonathan instilled uh, some of the American-style uh, boxing that he brought from uh, the Kronk Gym and, and from Detroit and his tutelage under uh, Emmanuel Stewart. And... Um, you know, I think Jonathan was with Cecilia maybe uh, six or seven or, or eight fights um, at the time. And then when Jonathan uh, became Triple G's trainer, uh, Cecilia felt that, you know, there'd be uh, naturally Triple G would be the priority as being one of boxing's biggest superstars. And uh, she looked at uh, it as an opportunity of, well, now Abel Sanchez. Abel had actually never trained a female fighter. And I actually, I actually, uh, and he was pretty kind of old school about that. He's like, well, you know, they don't train the same as the guy. <laughs> you know, they don't fight the same, whatever it is. And, uh, um, I, you know, she asked, uh, you know, could I put her in contact with Abel? And he made an exception and agreed to, uh, to train Cecilia. And uh, I think with the first fight that she fought in Monte Carlo uh, last year, you saw... Uh, a pretty impressive display, and now the proof's going to be in pudding. I think it, it helps quite a bit uh, being in camp from January the entire time with Abel, so she gets used to a new training style, new new training techniques, actually the strategy in the ring, things of that nature. So I think that's been very beneficial uh, for her. And uh, with Jonathan, now this will be his third fight with Triple G, and you see Triple G getting used to Jonathan's style as well, and he's supposed to fight in September, so um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the proof will be in the pudding if, uh, if she looks good on August 15th, which she has no, it's no easy task fighting Jessica McCaskill, um, who's a, a unified champion at 140 pounds. Um, so it's going to be a tough fight for her. If she's successful, another record will be broken, uh, in terms of it, it, she has 25 title defenses right now, which is tied with the great Joe Lewis. Right. And it's hard to compare, uh, you know, heavyweight championship fights with where Cecilia's at, but when you look at the longevity of her career, everything that she's accomplished, uh, being undisputed champion for so long, making so many title defenses, when you can do 25 title defenses and then make the 26th one, that, that's historic for both uh, men or women uh, championship boxing. Tom, do you know if the fight, will it be uh, two-minute rounds or three-minute rounds? And also, do you think they should go to three-minute rounds to make it... So the, the girls can get more tired and you actually see more knockouts because, you know, that that's what the pain fans really want to see. Fans like to see knockouts. You're right yeah. about that. That's how Triple G became so popular. Uh, he was knocking everybody out. He had 23 knockouts in a row. <laughs> uh, he became a fan favorite. You know, he sold out Madison Square Garden. He broke the, the record. There were so many great champions that have fought here at the Stuff Up Center, which is now Dignity Health. And he broke his first fight there. He broke the sales record, the ticket record, uh, of attendance where we actually had to add stands uh, the first time ever in, in, uh, in that arena's, uh, that stadium's uh, history. So that was, a, that was a Rubio fight, right? That was the Rubio fight. Yeah. And, uh, and then he sold out the forum naturally he sold out uh, T-Mobile arena up in uh, Vegas for both of the Canelo fights. He sold out the O2 arena 
when he fought Kell Brook, he uh, agreed to go over to the UK. Uh, you know, Triple G is uh, uh, just an international star. That's, that's the best way I can put it. You know, just a fan favorite and um, what he's accomplished. And uh, so getting back to the style, like you said, uh, um, to, to answer your question, you know, there's the debate. The debate is, you know, if there's three-minute rounds, then there'd be more of a chance of a knockout. Although sometimes if the, if the female champions get tired, then their style starts, uh, uh, you know, getting a little bit, uh, well, it looks like I'm trying to be politically correct here. So uh, I, I certainly don't want to diminish uh, the female champions because I've worked with Layla Ali. I did two fights with Layla. I've worked with Sia Riker. I think they're right. tremendous athletes. I think there's so many popular fighters now uh, in female boxing that I really think it's uh, uh, it's becoming, uh, it, it's really coming into its own. And you got to uh, give uh, the network's credit, like HBO. Uh, put Cecilia on uh, Showtime has pre pushed uh, Clarissa Shields, uh, Katie Taylor's with Eddie, uh, Mikhail Myers with ESPN and Top Rank. So you know there's a lot of uh, popular fighters uh, that are that are coming up. Uh, I'm pers just my personal opinion is I like to see the two minute rounds. Uh, I know that WBC has really been uh, adamant about two minute rounds from a health and safety standpoint, but. I think it's just more exciting when you know there's only two minutes. You can go, you can actually fight at a faster pace mm -hmm. than if, you know, sometimes in the three minute round for men's boxing, you'll see some holding, you'll see some running or, or boxing, whatever. And sometimes it can be uh, not as exciting, not the Triple G fights naturally because he would press the action all the time. But um, if, if it's a two minute round, I think you'll see, I actually think female boxing benefits from that because it becomes more of a compact round and where uh, the female champions know that they can go at a faster pace, more exciting pace uh, for two minutes. So it's a 10 rounds of two minutes. And uh, I actually think it, it creates more excitement. Maybe it's not, not as many knockouts, but overall uh, a more exciting pace uh, for the two minute rounds. W women's MMA kind of exploded onto the scene with Ronda Rousey and then Cyborg, Amanda Nunez. Uh, do you think boxing should really look at what they did and try to copy that? Yeah, there was one time where uh, Ronda Rousey was the most popular uh, champion in the UFC. Uh, she was the peak of her career. And I remember Dan, Dana famously said uh, he'll never work with a female uh, uh, UFC fighter. So uh, she definitely broke down the doors there. And now you have Amanda Nunez, uh, so many, you know, Chris Cyborg, so many popular fighters. Uh, in MMA, that uh, uh, you got to give them a lot of credit. Uh, Zhang from uh, China, uh, she's extremely popular. Uh, I, I love watching uh, female uh, uh, UFC fights or MMA fights. And um, uh, I really think that with more females competing in boxing, I mean, it just became an Olympic sport uh, recently. Cecilia wasn't able to, to compete in the Olympics, but Clarissa was lucky enough to have the opportunity to fight uh, in the Olympics and uh, won two gold medals. I know a lot of the girls were supporting her uh, in her gold medal uh, uh, bid. And uh, uh, I think with the more uh, talent pool, deeper talent pool, that's when you'll see the bigger events. Like, uh, you know, if we, uh, if Cecilia is successful August 15th and Katie Taylor is successful August 22nd, uh, that becomes a huge uh, fight, not only for women's boxing, really the, the biggest fight ever in women's boxing, but uh, for the overall sport of boxing, uh, that's a huge that's a huge event. So um, I, I think with the advent of more uh, females uh, getting talented females getting into boxing, uh, I, I think you're seeing the popularity and the talent level uh, increasing. Tom. Uh Danny and I were both present for the uh, Triple G Vanus Martrosian fight in yeah. the, the, I don't know, was it May 2018, 2017? I remember that very well. That was May 5, Cinco de Mayo, 2018. Uh, Two th Triple G's original opponent, <laughs> unfortunately, got suspended. And uh, so we were scrambling. Uh, he was supposed to actually fight, uh, boy, I forgot his name, uh, uh, it's gonna not look good, but anyway, it'll come to you. It'll come to you. 
He was supposed to fight the... Uh, the uh, Jaime, Mung Jaime Munguia? Jaime Munguia, right. Uh, unfortunately, the Nevada Commission uh, didn't approve Munguia. I never uh, understood that. I never understood why. He was 28-0 with 25 knockouts. Uh, he was a big junior middleweight. Right. Um, Triple G is not the youngest guy, you know, in the world. So I, I didn't really, I, I personally didn't understand it. I, I didn't know, you know, it's it's their ruling for health and safety. But you know, now Jaime Munguia is considered, I think, the best uh, junior middleweight champion, you know, in that time since 2018. In what is it, two years now, he's elevated himself to the best uh, junior middleweight champion. I think that would have been a tremendous fight, especially on Cinco de Mayo. But because we weren't able to make that fight, we had to, I famously told people, don't cancel your tickets. Triple G will still fight in Las Vegas at the MGM. And then I, we got the, the carpet pulled out from under us because, you know, pay-per-view loves the fight. MGM loves the fight. Uh, but for w whatever reason, uh, the Nevada Commission wouldn't approve that fight. And uh, uh, so we had to go uh, back to uh, StubHub Center, literally on the shortest promotion I've ever worked on. It was... Uh, I think literally uh, two weeks or maybe even a day less than two weeks where uh, we had to scramble, put together the fight with Bonus Marrosian. It's not easy to find opponents in general to fight Triple G and to fight, find someone on short notice to fight him was <laughs> virtually impossible. So we yeah. had to give Bonus a lot of credit. Uh, and Don King made the deal uh, to uh, to allow Bonus to fight. And, uh, you know, once again, so not only does he hold the record at that stadium for the most people in attendance, he broke the record for uh, the highest gate, uh, which which naturally he was a lot more popular when he fought Bonas uh, than when he when he fought Marco Rub Antonio Rubio the first time. So uh, we have a, a definite definite affinity for uh, Dignity Health uh, uh, Stadium. At, at that event, Tom uh, Cyborg came in with her yeah. entourage, That's and they right. were all wearing Cyborg <laughs> v Cecilia Breakers yeah. two thousand something like. So the summer of 2019, um, Cyborg, unfortunately, ended up losing her undefeated record to Amanda Nunez. Right. Um, but will we still see that crossover fight in the future? That's the fight where, uh, that's the fight where uh, HBO had agreed to put uh, Cecilia on. Uh, if you remember, uh, Chocotito was supposed to be the co-feature on the pay-per-view with Munguia. And then Cecilia was going to be on the pay-per-view uh, as well. But then uh, Chocotito, uh, I believe he got injured, and he had to pull out, and that opened the door for Cecilia uh, to be this, the co-feature on HBO. And, uh, yeah, Chris Seiberg was there. Uh, they have a ton of respect for each other. I know Cecilia res respects everything that Chris Seiberg has accomplished in MMA and vice versa. And... Uh, that would be a huge fight too. If uh, I mean, Cyborg is a tremendous stand-up uh, puncher, <laughs> a very strong, and a big punching power. And I think uh, out of a lot of the MMA fighters, uh, I think she would make a, a great transition into stand-up uh, boxing. But uh, you know, it got derailed a little bit, like you said. Uh, she lost to Amanda Nunez. Cecilia went uh, and signed this contract. Now with a matchroom in the zone, but if there's a way to put that together in the future, I think that would be a, a tremendous uh, event, not only for boxing, but a crossover event where uh, we've seen some boxers go to uh, uh, UFC and not do so well. Like, you know, James Tony is, is an example. You know, once you have so much training and stand up and you get, uh, you get into someone with jujitsu or wrestling skills, it's pretty much over when you're on the ground. But we saw Holly Holm be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, being a boxer and going to uh, UFC. But I think uh, if anyone can make the transition the other way around, I think uh, Chris Cyborg uh, definitely uh, uh, is so talented and, and so strong at boxing, uh, stand-up boxing, that uh, she would do really well. That sounds like a fight for StubHub. <laughs> uh, definitely could be. Yeah, it de <laughs> definitely uh, could be. I mean, Chris Cyborg lives, lives here locally. Yep. In California, Cecilia trains now at uh, Big Bear, California. So uh, that that would be a natural uh, location for a fight like that. Tom, do you think uh, you know with with Cyborg? Obviously, she she now fights for Bellator MMA. Yes, um, she was with UFC, but obviously they you know after the loss and everything, you know, they, they've had she's had some issues with Dana White. That's been obviously publicized in the media, obviously. Yeah. Um, and since uh, you had an initial deal with. Uh, UFC fight pass at the beginning of this year. Um, I mean, do you, do you think Cyborg, if you could get her to come fight 
in a boxing match, uh, you know, under your promotion or something? I mean, do you think she, it'd be difficult to get her to fight under the UFC fight pass just because of the the pass she has with them? Or would you look at it at another way to do it? I think it'd be a different way to do it. I think it'd be a different uh, platform. That actually could be a pay-per-view event. Pay-per-view event. Uh, there's so many different platforms that I think would have a, a ton of interest. Could be on the zone since Cecilia is with Matchroom and, and the zone could be uh, on, on that platform. Um, you know, so it, it's really premature, you know, under these conditions, under these virus times, as I tell, as I call them, <laughs> we're just going to be happy to get through August 15th, you know, and then if Katie Taylor wins, that's a great fight. So, Talking about a cyborg fight is like way down the road, so everything is so premature. And we saw the zone launch, what, just a couple of years ago, and uh, you know they've become a huge player in uh, boxing. So you never know if there might be even a, a different player uh, at that time down the road. So it's it's really hard to speculate on that. But I think if a fight like that is made, I think uh, definitely we'll be able to figure out uh, a platform that would uh, that be uh, viable for, uh, for for that event. Kind of going back to Cecilia, uh, Tom, um, just because like we talked about Katie Taylor and Delphine Pursuit are going to rematch yeah. um, in the next couple of weeks as well. Um, and obviously the first first match that they had had a lot of scrutiny. You know, there was some people who said, oh, you know, Pursuit might have edged it or Katie Taylor got the win, obviously. But um, when you were able to talk to Cecilia after that, whether it was that day or the next day or – couple weeks later when you had a conversation what was her what was her opinion on that fight did she think katie taylor deserved the win on that night and the first matchup uh you know that's a good question i didn't really ask her uh, she she definitely it was a tremendous fight like you said it's very close i could have seen a draw um in that fight which would have been interesting because i think they were fighting for uh for students titles mm -hmm. or at least she was wbc champion so i think that was a unification fight but uh um, uh, I thought it was a very close fight. Cecilia thought it was a very close fight. She thought uh, Pursun uh, maybe surprised uh, Katie, that Katie wasn't 100%, uh, not that she wasn't prepared, but I think she was a little bit surprised that uh, Delphine was as strong as she was. So I, I was listening to an interview that uh, Cecilia uh, gave, and she says that she thinks Katie will be better prepared for Delphine Pursun in the rematch, and she expects... Uh, Katie to have a more dominant win. Uh, a lot of credit to Delphine Pursun. She fought her, she fought her heart out in that first fight. Like I said, I could have seen a draw in that fight with the Pursun retaining her title. But uh, Cecilia said that she thinks that Katie was a little bit surprised that uh, Delphine's uh, style, her strength and uh, tenacity, and uh, she'll be better prepared uh, for her uh, the second time around. Uh, and obviously Cecilia is headlining that DAZN card in Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. uh, which is happening outdoors, like you said. Yeah. Um, so that should be an, an interesting sight to see. Uh, on on it, it, it's, 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 it's a night event. It's happening in the evening, right? Yeah, local time uh, Tulsa. Uh, I was just talking to uh, the guys at Matchroom today. I think it's going to be 10.15 or 10.30 uh, local time. So it's going to be an evening event. Uh, it is uh, uh, humid and, and pretty hot out there in uh, in Tulsa in the summertime, but uh, I think by the time it hits uh, that time of the night, uh, it's supposed to be comfortable around 75 degrees. Uh, so that that should be a great. You know, I, I personally love outdoor events. Uh, you know, we did the out some outdoor events when James Tony fought at Fantasy Springs. Out there was an outdoor event that got really hot out there, and uh, <laughs> uh, naturally the uh, Dignity Health or Stub Hub Center. Uh, those are outdoor events. Um, Cecilia fought outdoors in Norway. We did a lot of the, the Klitschko events. Um, were actually in soccer stadiums, so it wasn't necessarily outdoors, but it had that outdoor feeling. Wembley Stadium, I mean, that's probably the highlight uh, of the outdoor events I've worked on, uh, where Vladimir fought Anthony Joshua. Not only the atmosphere there, but the fight inside the ring. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when Vitaly Klitschko fought Lennox Lewis, I thought that was one of the most exciting heavyweight fights I've ever seen. And it was back and forth action. I thought Vitaly was winning. Well, he was winning the fight on all the judges' scorecards, so four rounds to, to two to the sixth round. But, uh, you know, they, they uh, unfortunately stopped the fight because of the uh, the cut. But that was an exciting fight. Vladimir Klitschko against uh, Anthony Joshua. Where Vladimir gets knocked down, then he knocks Joshua down. 
a lot of people thought Joshua was get, wasn't getting up from that right hand, uh, which actually surprises me because when you see the Andy Ruiz fight, Andy mm. definitely didn't hit him like Vladimir hit him. No. Hit him so <laughs> with his powerful right hand. And I think Andy just kind of caught him on a temple. And yeah. Knocked, knocked his the equilibrium uh, out of whack. And uh, But you got to give uh, AJ a lot of credit for getting up uh, from that knockdown and then coming back and then uh, famously uh, landing that uppercut, which uh, stopped Vladimir from losing the 11th round out there. But, you know, that was a tremendous uh, outdoor event there at, uh, at Wembley Stadium. So, uh, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to it. It's kind of a unique atmosphere, you know, just being outdoors. Uh, this will be different for sure. No fans in attendance, so you know, it'll be outdoors and quiet <laughs> out there in Tulsa. But uh, we're, look, we're looking forward to it. We're just happy that uh, Matchroom has a date and a location for Cecilia, and uh, I know she's happy uh, to get this training camp over with and to uh, finally get in the ring since uh, she's been in camp for uh, since January. Tom, you mentioned Klitschko there, and he always seems to tease us with uh, with his return. Um, with Mike Tyson fighting Roy Jones Jr. and this uh, League League of Legends or something like that it's called, do you think we may see either of them return, Vitaly or Vladimir? Um, I don't think Vitaly, because Vitaly is the mayor of Kiev. I mean, that, <laughs> that has a huge responsibility uh, that goes with it. Uh, what Vitaly is taking on, I mean, I had a tremendous amount of respect for him as a boxer, as a person. Uh, both the Klitschko brothers are PhDs. They're two of the smartest, uh, not only boxers or athletes that I know, but just individuals. I mean, they're so worldly uh, and educated, well-spoken. They speak, so, uh, you know, I think four different languages. And uh, uh, so Vitaly being the mayor of Kiev and all the political uh, pressure that he has and responsibility, uh, he didn't have to go into politics. He, he could have retired easily, very comfortably there in uh, Ukraine or Germany were really retired wherever he wanted to in the world. And uh, uh, he decided to fight for the people, uh, bring about some positive change for the city of Kiev, make it more uh, westernized, uh, more uh, uh, shifting towards a kind of European lifestyle since he lived in Germany for so long uh, during his fighting days. And uh, got to give him a lot of credit because that's not an easy situation. You have Russia as your neighbor that uh, invaded <laughs> part of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and so he's got a big battle on his hands and he's trying to improve the infrastructure there of Kia. Um, you know, from what I understand, there's, you know, the, the old system is, is really hard to break because it was just so, so much rampant, uh, corruption, uh, there in Ukraine that it's really hard to get people's mentality to change. Uh, so I don't think you'll see, uh, Telly back. Every time I see Vladimir, he looks like he's still in fighting shape, <laughs> still in training camp. <laughs> That's actually the last time I was I was on an airplane when I flew to Miami and I saw Vladimir out there, at the end of uh, end of February, uh, first couple of days of March. I came back and uh, uh, like I said, every time I see him, he's in tremendous shape. He does he does tease a lot on social media. And every time I ask, I mean, I would love as a fan, not only working with him, but I would love as a fan to see him back in the ring because I thought uh, Vladimir. Uh, had so many tremendous knockouts. I really think that he's one of those guys that could come back. Uh, what's he now? Um, uh, 44. And uh, I really think he could come back and really compete at the top level of the game. Naturally, Mike Tyson and Roy Jones, that's, uh, those are huge headlines of them uh, going back in. But, you know, that's an exhibition and, and that's not really at the, at the elite level of the sport. But Vladimir, I think if he fought again, you know, whether he fought Deontay Wilder, whether it was a rematch with Fury, whether a rematch with uh, AJ, uh, I really think he's is still at that highest uh, competitive level. So I would personally like to see it, but I'm not the one in the ring that's going to get <laughs> in the face. So that's completely up to Vladimir. People ask me that question all the time. Do I think uh, if he's going to come back? And I said, Vladimir is the only one that knows uh, whether uh, it's something that he wants to do. He, Vladimir is another one that doesn't need financially for sure uh, so many title defenses that he made uh, fighting in Germany, selling out soccer stadiums all over the world. He definitely doesn't need to fight financially, but you know, a lot of these successful uh, champions and Vladimir had one of the longest runs, I think the longest time wise run as being a heavyweight champion um, where if he wanted to be back into that spotlight, I think he could with the right preparation compete at that, uh, like I said, at that top level. 
just you know working with him and being a fan, as you said, is there anybody that he ever spoke about that you know that you think he would come back and fight like an it like a little itch that he needs to scratch, like the rematch with Joshua or something like that? I think he wants to get Tyson Fury back in the ring. <laughs> he, uh, he was disappointed how that night went. Yeah, um, I, I I would have bet my house on him winning that. Yeah, that was that was a surprise to to all of us. But you look, you got to give Tyson Fury credit, and he proved it again. It wasn't just a fluke; he proved it again against uh, Deontay Wilder. But uh, Tyson Fury did what uh, what over uh, I think a ten year or twelve year span, what nobody could do. Uh, and he went to Germany uh, and and won the fight. So you got to give him credit for that. But uh, uh, there were a number of things on that night that I think Vladimir. Uh, might have done differently, and uh, um, so I, I think he would like that fight again. Uh, I always personally wanted to see him against Deontay Wilder. Uh, Deontay has a uh, huge power uh, in his hands. Vladimir has big power. They sparred together before. Uh, Vladimir actually had jo- Anthony Joshua up to training camp in the Austrian Alps that I was telling you about. Deontay Wilder, Joseph Parker. I mean, a who's who? Dillian White, a who's who of top elite. Uh, heavyweights now, and they were all his sparring partners, uh, you know, throughout the years. And Emmanuel always wanted to get the best guys in. And even Tyson Fury was there. He wasn't there for sparring, but Emmanuel kind of took Tyson under his wing and really saw something in Tyson Fury. And he told everyone at the time, he said, that this man will be a heavyweight champion at some time. And Emmanuel was right. Uh, Tyson Fury shocked the world against uh, Vladimir Klitschko. And, uh, you know, I had a tremendous fight the first time against Wilder, and I think he put an exclamation point on it uh, with, the, with the rematch with uh, Wilder. So, uh, yeah, uh, Vladimir, Vladimir uh, really groomed a lot of people and showed them what a, what a true, uh, disciplined, structured uh, heavyweight champion he was. And I think uh, everyone that was up there at the time uh, learned a tremendous amount uh, uh, from being up in the camp uh, and training with Vladimir. Look at all those names you mentioned. They're all in the top five of the heavyweight division. That's literally sparring. That you know, people always say like they'd pay to see that sparring. Like you definitely would pay to see that sparring. <laughs> oh, there was uh, there was some electric uh, sparring matches, and I gotta tell you, Vladimir. See, Vitaly would work on his style, so he didn't care if he didn't look good in sparring. It didn't matter to him as long as he was good in the fight. That was fine for Vitaly. And a lot of times, you know, he's awkward and. And that type of thing. So it did, like I said, it didn't matter. He has a lot of respect for his uh, uh, training partners, and and uh, he just wanted to improve his style under his coach at the time, uh, Fritz Stunek. Uh, Vladimir, on the other hand, he always wanted to show that he was the heavyweight <laughs> champion of the world. So if for some reason, one guy had a pretty good day against him, and again, you know, these are these are elite guys, the top guys uh, at the time, coming in to train with Vladimir, and so. You know, if you have an off day and the other guy looks good or, you know, we had literally, I was going over with Jonathan Banks. I mean, literally we had like 10 to 12 guys at a time and, and top level guys. Uh, even, uh, I mean, I, I, the list goes on and on. I, I could uh, keep going uh, uh, over uh, more and more names. Devera Williamson was in at one time. Uh, uh, anyway, there's so many, so many names, but um uh, uh, Vladimir would always, if like I said, someone like after like he's been in with the fourth or fifth guy and he was getting a little bit tired and here's a, a new guy coming in, fresh two rounds, uh, the next day he would say, okay, I want that guy for three or four rounds. And <laughs> he would make sure there was no question in that camp who was the best uh, in the world. And, and he, he always uh, uh, wanted to show that he was uh, the heavyweight champion. So he, he, didn't, he didn't abuse sparring partners uh, for sure. They were treated uh, very well. Uh, sometimes you see guys kind of brought in and, and they're like overmatched and, and uh, you know, I even, uh, you know, so that, that's unfortunate to see, but uh, Vladimir always treated, uh, both Vladimir and Vitaly treated their sparring partners with the utmost respect uh, because, you know, sparring partners are, are there to help you. You know, if you don't uh, respect them, then, uh, you know, Triple G is another perfect example. He always appreciates the, the guys that come in and help him train for the fight. And uh, treat them as as uh, as great as they can. You know, they were staying in the, the five star hotel uh, resort in the Austrian Alps. They got to eat uh, all this uh, 
you know, help people <laughs> food, you know, cook food at this five star restaurant. And a lot of guys didn't want to leave. <laughs> it was like I wouldn't say it's a vacation because we had to spar uh, four days a week. But uh, the days off, they definitely uh, took advantage of it, and uh, they really enjoyed the time up there. And uh, yeah, those those were great times in the uh, Stanford Hotel, it's called, in the uh, Austrian Alps, the official training camps. Uh, Tom, you know, uh, speaking of uh, of we we touched on Triple G. Obviously, you're, you've been involved with this team for a number of years now. Is there anything on the horizon for him? Uh, does he want to f- kind of fight during this pandemic? Because, I mean, you know, you got to respect fighters' decisions if they don't want to fight during this pandemic because, you know, it, there's obviously elevated risks involved. But, like, you know, is there any potential that we could see him maybe in front of no crowds right now? No, he definitely wants to fight. Uh, Jonathan Banks has been out uh, for the last week uh, training out here, just doing some foundation training. Uh, so now they're they're uh, kind of starting uh, the whole training camp. He's supposed to fight uh, in the fall. We don't have an exact date uh, for him yet, but uh, he does, as, as everyone knows, he has an exclusive contract of his own. And uh, so uh, I'm always excited when Triple G gets back uh, in the ring. He's one of my favorite fighters uh, uh, to watch. It's just to depend, you know, regardless of what, what style uh, someone brings, uh, he makes an exciting fight. You look at the first fight on HBO, uh, I mean, I was talking about Brian Savio before, how he would rise to the occasion of Madison Square Garden. Triple G, every time there was a new challenge from the first fight on HBO, the first time he fought in Germany when it was supposed to be on Vladimir Klitschko's undercard, and then Vladimir, or a co-feature, and then he got injured, and then he was headlining. Went from a 50,000-seat arena to a literally 500-seat <laughs> uh, ballroom uh, in Germany, but uh, he wanted to impress everyone there. A lot of the media was there still because of Klitschko fight. First time on HBO against Proxa. Proxa was very underrated. He was a European champion. He was a slick southpaw, moved around a lot. And you got to keep in mind uh, that HBO debut, he was supposed to fight. He was supposed to unify titles with uh, Dimitri Pirov. Mm. It was a killer at the time. He's the one that knocked out Danny Jacobs, WBO champion. Uh, it would have been great if that fight happened. He would have gotten that elusive WBO title, which he never was able to get. <laughs> uh, um, either from Peter Quillen uh, or from uh, Billy Joe Saunders. But um, uh, so Pira got injured. He actually wound up never fighting again, unfortunately. And then uh, uh, so Artie Palulu found pretty much the complete opposite style to Dimitri Pira, <laughs> who was a huge right handed puncher. He found uh, this slick uh, southpaw from Poland, the European champion. And uh, Triple G didn't care. Uh, he said, oh, right, it doesn't matter who. He just, uh, at that time, he was trying to get the exposure. If you remember, right? he was a tremendous fighter, but he didn't have any television exposure. Right. And so, uh, again, I, uh, I go back to uh, giving Peter Nelson a lot of credit at the time, uh, having the foresight of uh, putting him on. Uh, and the only reason he got that Pirog fight, a lot of people uh, forget, but uh, Daniel Giel was supposed to fight Pirog. That was going to be a unification fight. And then Giel got a bigger offer to go to Germany to fight Felix Sturm, which he took. He thought that was a, a better fight for him. Uh, and that opened up the door for Triple G to fight Piro. And so he went through a lot of different uh, things, sacrifices to get on HBO, and, and uh, he made the most of it. And uh, uh, so oh, getting back to your question, you know, when I start talking about these guys, I kind of no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Keep going, but uh, yeah, uh, he's he's supposed to have a fight coming up uh, here in the fall, and hopefully we can announce that uh, pretty soon in terms of the uh, date and the location. Uh, and you know, the way it's going uh, now, uh, most likely there's not gonna, if there's any fans, it's not going to be a lot. And uh, you know, most of these shows now these days with the bubble is there there's no fans uh, in attendance, so. Uh, we're still trying to figure that one out. So before uh, before we let you go here, Tom, you know, obviously we appreciate uh, the time you've spent with us here this week for uh, this episode 91 of the last round. Um, but, you know, uh, we had told some people you we were coming on and stuff like that. And then uh, most, it's mostly the hardcore boxing fans who, who know about this. But every Sunday you do go uh, normally on the Santa Monica track. Yeah. With the editor, with the editor in chief of the Ring Magazine, Dougie Fisher, uh, right. who was on, who was on with us uh, last week, he's been on our show quite a few times, so we appreciate that. But um, 
uh, some people ask me like, you know, how can we never see Tom do the jump jump rope or do the ten pull ups and stuff? I feel like Dougie's just trying to, I feel like Dougie's just trying to flex on him and trying to show show him up. So like, you know, what they want to know your response to that, man. I can uh, actually, you know, uh, I can jump rope pretty good. Uh, so I, I'm the one. It's on my uh, phone, on my uh, Instagram, or on the on the Periscope. So uh, I'm the one holding the camera. You know, it's nice when we have someone else. Uh, actually, uh, uh, there's a couple guys, either Mike Styles would, would come out occasionally or, uh, Samir would help us with it. But, uh, if it's just Doug, uh, coach Dave or myself, then I'm, I'm the one, uh, <laughs> you know, holding the, uh, the phone. So, but I, I get my uh, workouts in, I, I run two miles on the tracks. Uh, I can jump rope. I can do the pull-ups. Doug's better at the pull-ups. I'm probably better, <laughs> better at jumping rope uh than doug but uh you know one of these days maybe we'll switch up and i'll i'll uh, go on the camera uh, the good old jump rope but the impressive thing about what doug does jumping rope is not only does he jump rope but he answers these obscure questions <laughs> in sports who's been attending boxing matches for you know 74 years uh he comes up with these I, i've never even heard of some of these names and doug's like okay here's the opponent here's where they fought this is the year they fought this is the you know he, he, Doug Fisher is such an encyclopedia of walking, boxing uh, knowledge, uh, right. not just current knowledge. I mean, my knowledge goes back to like early 90s, you know, maybe late 80s. Uh, that's kind of my wheelhouse. But, uh, I mean, they're talking about fighters from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 40s, you know, even going back uh, earlier than that. So, yeah, really impressed with the uh, Doug's knowledge uh, of some of these super obscure, obscure uh, fighters and names, and, and I think that's just entertaining to to listen to him rattle off uh, his <laughs> answers. Absolutely, yeah, he's definitely an exact encyclopedia. I think that's the perfect descriptive word you can use for him. Yeah, um, and uh, we had Jonathan Banks because he was in L.A. Like I said, training mm-hmm. Triple G. Uh, we had him on the show uh, last last Sunday, so. You know, and Jonathan is a wealth of uh, information, you know, growing up, uh, really growing up in Emmanuel's house uh, in Detroit. Uh, Emmanuel was his mentor and, uh, you know, everything related to the Kronk gym and the fighters that Emmanuel trained. And Jonathan was involved with the Klitschko camps, with the Lennox Lewis camps. So anything you ever want to know, uh, he would be interesting actually to have on the show because he could talk about how the training's going with Triple G and and uh, maybe after we have something announced, uh, he could talk about the fight and the matchup and everything. Uh, but uh, yeah, Jonathan impressed me as well as uh, you know his boxing knowledge, and uh, he's very well spoken. Kind of quiet in terms of uh, not very, you know, outgoing. Some trainers are just kind of in your face, and Jonathan <laughs> a lot more uh, relaxed, kind of laid back. But uh, he's very effective on his uh, on his training stuff. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, we're here. Uh, we're here. So anytime he's a uh ready to come on obviously we'll we'll be glad to have him but you know uh, once again tom obviously we want to thank you for your time uh luckily you're on the west coast over here with us we're we're on the southern california area so sometimes we get uh you know guests from the east coast or sometimes they're in england or europe so we kind of have to play with the time here so it's kind of nice to have a west coast person sometimes it's easier for all the parties involved Uh, but obviously august 15th you have the DAZN card with Cecilia Brekus, uh against Jessica McCaskill coming up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, which is going to be an outdoor venue. So yeah. that should be interesting. Um, but, um, you know, before we let you go, Tom, go ahead and, and plug. Obviously, you got the DAZN card coming up with uh, Cecilia Brekus, like I just mentioned. Uh, go ahead and plug anything you anything else you got upcoming in your social media. Yeah, we're just uh, we're just excited about uh, August 15th on DAZN USA. Got to give a lot of credit to uh, Matchroom USA. Uh, to Eddie and uh, and Frank uh, and everyone, they they got tremendous staff there. Um, uh, watch for uh, an announcement with Triple G should be coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, and then uh, you know we'll just uh, keep keep uh, firing away. Firing away. Um, glad that boxing is back and uh, look forward to uh, to the show on, uh, on August fifteenth. Don't miss don't miss that one. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we appreciate it, Tom. Thank you very much, and uh, you have a good rest of your night here. Great. It's, it's great talking to you guys. You guys are very uh, uh, in-depth uh, boxing <laughs> guys. And, uh, uh, yeah, anyone that wants to follow, uh, you know, my social media is uh, at TomLawfer1 on both uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram, so that's easy. 
uh, easy to find. And uh, like you said, those track videos, uh, anyone who <laughs> hasn't seen them uh, Sunday mornings, they're not at a mm-hmm. specific time because it kind of depends on uh, everyone's schedule. But uh, usually Sunday mornings around uh, 10 or 11 o'clock uh, LA time, West Coast time, uh, you can tune into the uh, either the Periscope or the uh, Instagram live. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Tom, uh, we appreciate it. You know, anytime you uh, you want to come back on or uh, like you said, you want Jonathan Banks on or any, when, especially when your promotion gets back on its feet during this pandemic era and, uh, yeah, absolutely. you know, reach out to us and uh, we'll be more than happy to have some of your fighters and some of your people on. Yeah, sounds good. I, I appreciate that, guys. Tom Loeffler, man. He's one of the good guys, right? I could listen to those Klitschko stories all night. Yeah, he's he's good. Huh? Like when he starts talking about that, like you know, he he talks about like Klitschko having that itch. I don't mm-hmm. think he really said he had that itch, but he, it was just more his opinion. But you know, sometimes sometimes media outlets will talk about like, oh, you know, Tom Tom Loeffler says Klitschko wants to come back, and it's just like, well, he didn't really say that. He just says, well, you know, he, I'm sure you know because he's always he's right though. Like Klitsch, Vladimir Klitschko is always looks in shape. Yeah. Even since he, and he's and he retired what 2015? That was the Anthony Joshua fight. Wow, was it that long ago? I think so, wasn't it? Or was it 2016? Uh, yeah, most, maybe it is. Maybe it's five years. Yeah, so four or five years, something like that. Yeah. Like, and and he's right. Like every time that, that was, he could brought up a good point. Klitschko is always in shape. I mean, you know, he's works out. A lot of these guys, you know, stay in the workout routine. But I mean, he's right though. Like I mean, at 44 years old, obviously, father time is undefeated, but. I mean, maybe, maybe he's, he might still have enough left in the tank to come back and have that one last hurrah. But, you know, I mean, like, I'm cool with him staying retired, though. You know, I know we're, like, touching on it, which is kind of interesting. Because, like, he went out, even though he went out in a loss to Anthony Joshua, like, it was an awesome fight. It was one of the best fights and one of the best events you've ever seen. Like, especially if you were there live, obviously, like... You know, two heavyweight gods at the moment fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world who knock each other down and the other ones get up and knocks the other one down. Like, I mean, retiring after that, even though you you lost, I mean, I, it doesn't really get any better than that, right? I was surprised that he he, he retired on a loss just because of how competitive a person he, he is. You know, his record, you know, even though... He lost that fight with Anthony Joshua. They both came away with good credit because he dropped Joshua, didn't jump on him and, you know, finish him off and um, ended up losing. But I thought just as a competitive person, the way that he was, you know, like when he uh, had such a long, like 10-year career at the top of the heavyweight division, I was surprised he didn't, uh, you know, rematch Joshua or come back and, you know, just fight somebody else in Germany just to say farewell to the fans. So... I wonder. I do wonder if that's something that kind of like irks him a little bit. That fight and also the fight with Tyson Fury, because you know Fury used to play head games with him and tease him and <laughs> stuff like that. So I do wonder. You know, if like Tom said, if he comes back, does he want to fight Tyson? Because Tyson's not a huge puncher. You know, Tyson's right. not, not somebody that's going to like you know put you in hospital and you know kind of you know really really injure someone of uh, of like who's forty four years old, maybe even forty five, if he actually does return. You know, where like someone you wouldn't want him to fight like a Wilder, because you know yeah. Wilder, could, you know, really, really hurt you. Tyson's kind of like, well, you know, like even against you know Fury against Wilder, like it was multiple punches that kind of did the damage to Deontay. So. You know who? You know who I would want to see, just because of the the pre-fight entertainment and the promotional aspect of it. Shannon the Cannon Briggs against Vladimir Klitschko, just because all that all those video clips of. Can it, uh, Shannon Briggs messy with Klitschko over the years? They would use that into promotional materials and video, like when he chases him, but like when he's on like a surfboard or something mm. like that, he, he does, he's like on a boat and he's doing like waves around him to make him fall. Man, I that was some of the funniest stuff I've ever seen in the sport. I was surprised that he didn't get the rematch just because of that. You know, commercially, <laughs> it would have sold because of all the time and expense that went into Shannon chasing him around the world. Um, yeah. It's so I was, crazy, I was man. kind of surprised that he, they didn't make it. Right. Yeah. But, you know, just because of the entertainment factor behind it, I, that'd be interesting. They're both older guys, you know, you never know, but 
whatever it is what it is but um you know um obviously we appreciate tom loffler of 360 promotions coming on jumping on this week of the last round for episode 91 uh and you know real quick the last few minutes of, of the episode here uh let's jump into the the reviews we'll start with uh this past saturday the first of august um from the newly developed matchroom fight camp in essex united kingdom on the zone um egg and cheese like i told you before i didn't i didn't i didn't put two and two together until i saw on twitter they were saying egg and cheese uh you know Ted Cheeseman against, uh, against the unanimous decision went over 12 rounds against Sam Eggington for the IBF International Super Welterweight title. What did you think, Mike? What a war. Greatest fight I've ever seen. You know, tw- Twitter did go a little bit crazy for it. You know, for the standard it was, like a British-level fight, you know, it's uh, kind of people were getting ahead of themselves com- comparing it to, like, Gatti Ward and, you know, <laughs> other, you know Canelo Triple G. But, you know, it was two British-level fighters that went at it. Uh, I thought Cheeseman did well. Um, Eggington did did really well. I thought it was maybe a little bit closer. Cheeseman maybe sneaked it. Uh, but, you know, to to start fight camp and to get, uh, you know, boxing back up and running, I thought it was a decent fight. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like you said, you know, there was a lot of publicity behind it. It was the first event back for Eddie Hearn and Matchroom, yeah. who – who is obviously, you know, for the last few years, especially has a, has a bit, has a bigger stronghold grip, uh, in England than Frank Warren does. So, you know, especially cause they, they, you know, they have a lot more capital in terms of, you know, monetary backup and stuff like that. And then because they were doing it in his backyard, it was just like a different spin on how to, how to do fights in the pandemic era. And then he's been promoting it. And obviously Eddie Hearn does a ton of interviews all the time. You know, whether it's Boxing Social, IFL TV, he does a ton of interviews. So he's always keeping himself and his company, you know, match or whatever in the the current news cycle. So, you know, I think it was more like you said, like, I, I agree. It's like people talking about Gotti Ward or all this, you know, greatest fight of all time. Obviously, it's premature. I think it was just people who were happy to see that boxing was back from a major promoter, even though Frank Warren was already had already put a couple fights on over there, but obviously, and from from a magnitude standpoint, Matchroom and Eddie Hearn, this was a lot bigger. Um, so Matchroom, I think it, Matchroom just capitalized off everything. You know, they've moved with the times. Like Matchroom constantly posting stuff on Twitter, Instagram. You know, over this pandemic, they've managed to really upgrade their YouTube page to some really class. Um, well cut different types of interviews uh, podcasts they've updated the matchroomboxing.com website where you can watch all the old fights and stuff like that they really have you know just moved with the times whereas frank warren doesn't do that many interviews you know the social media is like okay they don't go over the top and they just need to have a better salesman no right you're right and i i don't i don't think i don't think anybody can argue that out of all the major promoters at the moment, Golden Boy, Top Rank, PBC, uh, Matchroom, obviously. I think Matchroom or even you know Frank Warren's Queensberry Promotions, obviously, if you want to include them. I don't think you can argue that Matchroom and Eddie Hearn put a lot of stock into their marketing, their advertising, their their digital footprint, like you said, on YouTube, you know, the the behind the scenes stuff, you know, the interviews like I think Matru is is way ahead of the curve in terms of these other promote, promoters, you know, in terms of keeping a constant flow of content. I would think maybe Top Rank is right behind them. I mean, Top, what top Rank is good in terms of their social media. Yeah, I think the stuff that they do is um, always clean cut, very good promos. Their photographer, Mikey Williams, great modern style. Right. Always does, you know, those fisheye things and stuff from the air. Great shots. But then also, I think just Matchroom itself is, um, you know, they've got Matchroom UK, Matchroom USA, Germany, Spain, Italy. You know, they they are really, they really are trying to take over. You know, this isn't a Matchroom loving. It's just, you know, top rank do shows, (laughs) top rank do shows in the US. Right. PBC do shows in the US. That is it. Right. Golden Boy, the same. They may do a one-off one in Japan or something like that for, you know, a single fighter, but they don't do steady, consistent shows like Matchroom do. Right. No, you're right. 
you're right. You know, I think people are just happy to have uh, more boxing, especially one of the other major promoters uh, in in the UK, of course. Uh, and obviously, you know, quickly rounding off that card, uh, James Tennyson. Is that did I say that right? James Tennyson, TKO six over Gavin Gwynn for the vacant yeah. British lightweight title. Uh, good fight. Ten- Tennyson really just shown his power. That's why I think he's got something like 23 knockouts out of 27 wins. Right. Then Jordan Gill, that turns 25 and one, unanimous de- decision over Reese Bellotti. A uh, good fight. To be honest with you, I thought Jordan Gill really should have taken Reese Bellotti out. I know that Jordan Gill has just come back from an injury where he had a thyroid problem. Um, that was, you know, he was really struggling to make way all the time. He was feeling really, really tired and, you know, he took a lot of time off and sorted that out before he came back. But I thought Reese Bellotti was a little bit one-dimensional. I thought Jordan Gill, who kind of looked like he's going to be a world beater to begin with, should have really got him out of there. Uh, Fabio Wardley, now 9-0, TKO3 over Simon Vallely for the vacant English heavyweight title. Good fight for uh, Fabio Wardley. I think he's kind of coming of age because he was a white-collar fighter in the UK. Uh, obviously, his manager is Dylan White. Uh, Simon Vallely, ex, you know, British amateur, never really kind of lived up to his potential because of you know his, I don't know, behaviour away from the ring, shall we say? Outside uh, behaviour. Yeah, exactly. Getting in trouble with the law. So, uh, and then to finish to round it up, Dalton Smith turned six and zero with a KO five win over Nathan Bennett. Good fight, Dalton Smith. I thought he stepped up to the plate. I think if he carries on like he is, he's you know he'll kind of probably be a world beater somewhere down the line if he gets that promotional push from Eddie Hearn. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And then also this past Saturday from the Mohegan Sun Casino uh, in the state of Connecticut over here in the United States, uh, Showtime returns, PBC returns on Showtime. Uh, Mayweather Promotions gets another world champion. Uh, I believe this is their second world champion if you include Trevante Davis, right? Uh, Angelo Leo, Remains undefeated at 20 and 0 and gets the 12 round unanimous decision win to capture his first WBO Super Bantamweight world title as he defeats and hands Tremaine Williams his first career loss. What'd you think of that fight? I honestly thought the Tremaine Williams was going to win. When I saw that he got picked up and was replacing Stephen Fulton, who had to pull out uh, due to a positive coronavirus test. Uh, I thought Tremaine Williams had a better pedigree. I thw you know, his amateur background, because uh, he was one of the standouts coming out of the amateur scene. Another one who also got in trouble with the law, spent a little bit of time away, came back to the spot. I just thought he was actually going to outclass him. First four rounds were close. Angela Leo kind of stepped it up a gear and ran away with it towards the end. Um, I've not, never really seen a lot of Angela Leo. A lot of his opponents right. kinda, were kind of unknown. But, you know, he stepped up to the plate on that day and really took the WBO Super Bantamweight title with both hands. Right. Yeah. I know Mayweather Promotions uh, was definitely happy for that, you know, obviously getting another world title under their their banner. Because um, I think, you know, in terms of promoters or, or, you know, name recognition promoters, I think they had they have the, the less amount of titles under their stable if you compare them. Uh, they to don't the do other. anything. Right, right. Yeah, they need to put their fighters out there more, it's obviously. Just like, a, it's just like a hobby for Mayweather. <laughs> maybe, yeah. You yeah could, you it could, doesn't do anything works. with it. But maybe maybe this is a, maybe this is a, a you know, a spark, a spark plug to, to do a little bit more. Who knows? Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. But, you know, congratulations to, to Leo on his uh, first world title win. Because uh, you can tell he was obviously very happy about it. Um, and so was... Uh, CEO of Mayweather Promotions, Leonard Ellerby. You know, I saw following his Twitter. Uh, he was obviously tweeting his support and very happy about it, which was cool. Um, and also rounding out that rounding out that card is it Raiz Alim mm-hmm. remains remains undefeated at seventeen and zero with a tenth round TKO over Marcus Bates. Uh, what do you think of that fight? Uh, good fight. You know, obviously Alim was supposed to fight Williams. But William stepped up out of that fight to face Leo because of uh, Fulton's you know, co- positive COVID tests. So Aleem did you know, what he should have done, really, uh, fighting Bates. He just got him out of there. And then move on to uh, hopefully fight, it looks like, uh, Brendan Figueroa Jr., as this fight was a WBA, uh, what do you call it, eliminator. Eliminator, that's the word I was right. looking for. And then uh, ending that card, Joseph George. 
also remains undefeated with the ninth round T- oh, KO, not TKO, KO knockout over Marcos Escuadero, uh, who suffers the second loss of his career. Um, Joseph George was actually getting, a, a, at least from, from boxing Twitter, he was actually getting quite a, a, more attention than I assumed. You know, I, I, I His name was being thrown out there a lot in terms of boxing Twitter. What do you think? I mean, it's, the KO was, I don't know, KO of the year so far. So uh, right. the people that didn't maybe see that card, just go on Twitter, type in, uh, you know, Joseph George and look, out for, that, for, look out for that KO. It was a beauty. Right, right. Uh, and moving on to previews here towards the end of the show. Um, this Friday, the 7th of August, another edition of Matchroom Fight Camp in the backyard of Eddie Hearn's childhood home, uh, again, in Essex, Essex, UK on the zone. Uh, the main event is another, you know, coincidentally, like we just had Tom Loeffler talking about Cecilia Brakus and uh, Jessica McCaskill headlining the DAZN card in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, this one's also headlined by a female, uh, an all-female main event. Terry Harper, 10-0, goes against goes, goes up against uh, Natasha Jones, or is it Jonas? Jonas. Jonas, sorry, um, who's 9-1. and one. This is for the WBO. Uh, and IB and IBO Super Featherweight World Titles. What do you think of that fight? I think it should be a good fight. I think Terry Harper's been looking uh, really good, you know, really fresh now that she's gone full time uh, and, and as a you know unified world champion. Uh, Jonas didn't look too good a few fights ago when she was blown out by uh, the, the French lady. Um, but you know she's training with Joe Gallagher. Joe Gallagher's been saying how good she's been looking in camp. Um, so I think it. You know, it should be a good close fight. I would like to see Terry Harper win because uh, of all the back and forth between her and Michaela Mayer all, o- <laughs> all over Twitter. So there'd be kind of a good war. And Steffi Ball's been getting into that into it as well, uh, which is Terry Harper's trainer. So that'd be a good fight, you know, just to see because Michaela Mayer, top rank fighter against a matchroom fighter. So it'd be kind of a good cross promotion. Yeah, definitely. That's an interesting matchup, with that, especially with two different uh, promoters coming have, having to make that fight. Uh, rounding off that card, obviously, Chris Billiam Smith, ten and one, uh, goes 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 up against uh, Nathan Trolley for the Commonwealth Cruiserweight title. Uh, what's your initial reaction to this fight? Chris Billiam Smith, I think, up and coming. Uh, good to see if he can carry on, kind of evolving into a, a well-rounded cruiserweight. I can see really him taking this, even though he's had that one loss. Uh, I think he's kind of. Hopefully, Matrim will try to push him as the A side. He's, you know, he's a clean, cut, good-looking dude. I can see them, you know, kind of trying to hang in some promotion on him. So, good fight, though. Good fight, good fight. Also on yeah. the also on the card, Anthony Fowler, twelve and one, uh, returns against Adam Harper, nine and one. What do you think of that fight? I'll, Anthony Fowler, you either love him or you hate him, right? You know, it's <laughs> the uh, the C B D love hate. Yeah, he has that love hate relationship with the crowd. Uh, the CBD salesman on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Andy Ruiz's friend? Yeah, it's just I don't know, something. I don't like his style. I don't like he still has that very amateur, like he has his hands like out in front. He just has a very awkward style. It's not that great to watch. Um, you know, he took that loss against Scott Fitzgerald, which kind of, I think, humbled him a little bit. Mm-hmm. A tiny, tiny little bit because he's still tiny, big, tiny. Yeah, he's still got a big ego. Um, <laughs> I th- I could maybe see him slipping up against Adam Harper, even though Adam Harper's nine and one, because I just think he has a very awkward style. It's like he, he throws everything into every punch, and it kind of ties him out into the later rounds. Um, right. I don't know. It's just for, for someone to have such a very extensive amateur record, he has a very awkward, stiff style. Right. Um, but it should be a good fight, and I'm sure Anthony probably picked it so Fowler wins, so he can go back and have some of those fights against. Uh, a rematch with Scott Fitzgerald, maybe down the line, but he's ran into some troubles in his personal life as well. And then I don't know what ever happened to this O'Hara Davis fight. They were going back and forth on Twitter. They were doing interviews on IFL TV about Fowler fighting O'Hara Davis. I know there are different weight categories, but um, you know they were kind of building this up to be some huge fight when uh, when boxing came back, and then it just died. So maybe it was just all talk. Probably. Sounds like it was all talk. Yeah. Uh, obviously, two more fights left on this card. All right. It's been a while since I asked you to do this, Mike. You're going to have to pronounce these names. 
I think it's Aquib Fiaz, uh, 5-0. and is going to be against Kane Baker. That's just a spelling mistake on there. Um, uh, Fiaz looking like a great amateur pedigree. Kane Baker's obviously 13-6, and six, kind of brought in as a journeyman. Uh, Fiaz should really go in there, blow him out, look good. Uh, I think he's another one who they're hoping is going to have a big future if he can just keep his head in the game, keep himself buckled down. Uh, Hopi Price, great prospect, 2-0, and o, coming into fight. Uh, Johnny Phillips, 5-4. and four. Another really prospect should put on a good showing. Um, I'd put money on really happy price to, you know, probably get him out of there. So, you know, and then uh, the latest news and notes as we wrap up the show here, uh, you know, just quick, uh, quick reactions for each of these uh, headlines that have been happening in the news the last week or so uh, in the sport of boxing. Errol Spence and Danny Garcia have announced on their respective social media accounts that they've signed to fight. November 21st, what's your immediate reaction? See, normally you'd say Errol Spence would go in there and blow him out. But Errol Spence has had that car crash. So I'm guessing that either Errol Spence is, you know, back to around 100% because, you know, Danny Garcia really isn't, you know, just a mug to be taken lightly, you know. Uh, so is he going to just cash out? I think, you know, it's one of those where you're just going to have to see on the day when the bell rings, you're going to have to just see what Errol Spence is in the ring. Is he back to normal or is it an Errol Spence who's just going to go in there, get the biggest paycheck he could get and get out of the game because he's got underlying injuries that we don't know about. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. But I still give credit to Errol Spence for taking this fight. Cause I think a lot of people thought that the crash was going to push him to take uh, a voluntary defense uh, or like a tune-up fight, you know? Um, I don't think anyone would have said anything wrong with that. We wouldn't have given him shit for it, would we? So, well, obviously somebody would have gave him shit for it. Somebody oh, yeah. always yeah. gave he, he, But, I mean, like, from from a general perspective, yeah. He, he probably wouldn't have got any shit for it because he's obviously he was in a really bad car crash that, you know, could have been even worse than it was. Um, but, you know, he's coming back. And then this fight was supposed to originally happen in January of this year after the Porter fight uh, at Staples Center here in Los Angeles. But, um, you know, obviously Errol, Errol Spence, you know, stuff was in that car crash and other stuff. So, but, you know, he's, he's like you said, he's coming back. He could have taken a tune-up fight. Nobody really been, would have judged him for it, but he's coming back and fighting one of the top guys in the welterweight division who's been one of the top guys in the welterweight division, a former world champion and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that's the most intriguing notion about this fight it's just to see which Errol Spence are we going to see like are we going to see the one that you know has been you know dominant and then fighting the best fighters Sean Porter and all these guys Kel Brook or are we going to see not only ring rust but you know the after effects of a really bad car crash that had him I believe he was in the ICU for a little bit uh Mm -hmm. in the hospital so you know it was obviously very serious um but either way, it's an intriguing matchup, mm-hmm. and I and you know, I think personally that Spence is actually good to go. Um, I don't think the car crash is going to have anything to do to to do with it. I think obviously he knows his body better than anybody. I think he's going to be good to go, and he's going to be in there. And people are going to be like, "Oh my god, he looks better than ever even after the car crash." Like I, I think he's good to go. Like like I said, like I fully expected a tune up fight, but. You know, we'll see. So that's supposed to be on November 21st, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, and then at the end, at the age of 45, Sergio Martinez, who uh, passed guest of the show, who was on the show uh, a few months ago, um, is scheduled to return in Spain on August 21st. Uh, what do you? Think? I mean, obviously we expected that he was on the show. He was talking about trying to get a fight with Ch- a rematch with Chavez and stuff like that. So this isn't really surprising that he actually has a fight scheduled, but. You know, what's your initial take on that? Surprising because normally when people do that sort of stuff at that age, it's because of the need for money. But according to everybody in and around Martinez, you know, he's invested very wisely. He's a huge star in Spain and Argentina. Um, you know, he has he does comedy. He does TV shows. Sure. It's literally yeah. just because he wants to get in there as a competitor. You know, he's fighting somebody... Um, you know, like a, more of a journeyman type thing, but I think it's just one of those to, you know, get in there, knock the dust off, and I would imagine they'll probably try and do the Chavez fight, like you mentioned, just because, you know, it'll, it'll sell. It's a rematch. <laughs> they both have big uh, audiences in Mexico, Spain, and Argentina. 
So I'm sure right. I'm sure they'll make good money from it. Yeah, they'll figure it out somehow. Um, and then Pauli uh was just released from his Showtime commentary job that he's had for several years now, um, and has been replaced by uh, Abner Mares, uh, who was Abner Mares was just on the Showtime card this past Saturday. Pauli Malinaji, uh gave an interview to IFL TV. I think it was within the last couple months. I yeah. believe. I don't think it was like very, very recent. I think it was a couple months ago. Um, May, May, I think. Right. And then, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but obviously said some stuff about, you know, um, Eastern European fighters kind of being the more dominant fighters in the sport right now or something like that. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't want to say exactly what he said because, again, I don't want to get it wrong. I know it's a very sensitive topic, but obviously Showtime, CBS, didn't like it and they they chose to let him go um but i think regardless of whether you agree with what he said or not he was arguably the best part of that commentary team because he was so honest and yeah. he was he was a very good talker so i, I totally yeah. agree with you i think he was the best part of it i mean i don't really want to go over what he said because people are just going to twist and turn and you know come back at you for the stuff that he said but i think they used it Obviously, I have no facts about it, but I think they used it just to get rid of him because I'm sure he said other stuff on the show. You know, he said stuff about Manny Pacquiao taking steroids and Manny Pacquiao is now going to be fighting on that platform. Um, right. So I'm sure he's probably annoyed people with how, you know, black and white he is, how blunt he is. But that's why we loved him because instead of watching a fight and listening to the commentary tell us how great it is, you know, Paul, Paulie would tell us the truth and be like, this fight is trash. You know? <laughs> and that's why we loved, that's why we loved him because you get sick of it. Once you get older, you realize, you know, oh, they're, they're just telling us this fight's great because it's two of two showtime fighters and, you know, they need to promote it. Whereas with Polly, you knew what you were getting, you know, he would give you the truth. And, you know, I'm sick to death of listening to people like Brian Kenny and stuff like that. Just talk absolute trash the whole time about a fight, which isn't that great. You know, I understand they need to promote it because it's they're paying the money and they're not going to turn around and say, "Oh, this fight's terrible." You should turn the TV channel off. But sometimes, right. you know, just don't blow smoke up our asses because you don't want it. Times are changing. In the soccer in the UK, they have a lot of ex footballers on there, Gary Neville, Jamie Carragher, and they got on there and they spoke the black and white truth the whole time, and the fans loved it. And now the commentary's kind of changed in the UK, so that's what it is. And I, that's why I love Polly, because that's what he was like. You could listen to what he said, and he was knowledgeable. And I didn't always agree with what he said, but at least he told me his opinion, and I respected his opinion. Right. No, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. And, you know, unfortunately, this is obviously going to negatively affect other commentators or, or future commentators. Marriage is comment- trash. Yeah. Marriage is trash. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Mike. It is. It honestly is absolutely terrible. I thought that, that was the best one. And now they're going to replace and put Maris in it. Maris is absolutely terrible. <laughs> so we'll get used to him, man. I think he's uh, he's there to stay. So, you know, you're going to have to get used to him whether you like him or not, Mike. Good fighter, uh, but terrible to come to. <laughs> Gary Russell Jr. Uh, shoots back at Terrence Crawford. They've been having a little social media beef. I mean, I don't really want to touch on this, but like, you know, obviously it was in the news. Um, they're kind of going back and forth, you know, talking smack on each other on social media. I, you know, somebody I read somebody and it was kind of they hit the nail on the head. This is the most publicity that Gary Russell Jr. has had in his whole career. Yeah, it's to for people that don't know about it, Gary Russell and Terrence Cross have been going back and forth because I can't remember who started it, but Guy Russell said that he got into an altercation with Terence Crawford back in the day at the Olympic Training Center, where right. he, uh, he went up and punched him, and Crawford didn't do anything, just kind of like grabbed his face, and uh, I think it was kind of like supposed to be a passing comment, and then Terence Crawford denied it, and he had people in his camp saying that this never happened, and Guy Russell was saying, "Well, how would half these people know they weren't there?" <laughs> they were saying like Bomak wasn't there. Bomak was nothing to do with the Olympic Training Camp. So then because Crawford was trying to obviously hide from the fact that it happened, or maybe it didn't happen, I wasn't there. You know, um, they've been going back and forth, and then, you know, Gary Russell Jr. was sort of saying, like, well, hey, you know, let's fight then. You know, I'll come up to 140, 147, and let's, let's, let's fight. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, I guess, a quick review of it. Yeah, I mean, n- n- nothing's going to come out of it unless they really actually do fight, which is ridiculous, you know. Gary Russell's fighting at 126. <laughs> uh, you know, 20, 20 pounds 
and Crawford is essentially a 154 pounder, essentially. So, you know, uh, Adlet- like that's the only way this is going to pay off is if they really do make a fight at like 140, 147. Russell moves up. Like, other than that, nobody's everybody's going to forget to forget about this. Like they probably already have. So we apologize for bringing it up and reminding you, but it's probably just going to go away and you're not going to hear about it anymore. Um, but you know, once again, guys, we appreciate you guys sticking with us. Uh, this entire episode and big thanks again to the head of 360 boxing promotions tom loffler um who has a couple of his fighters coming up or one of his main fighters the undisputed welterweight female world champion cecilia Brekus, coming back august 15th on the zone from tulsa oklahoma against jessica mccaskill in the main event um once again like i said big thanks to tom loffler um who gave us quite a bit uh, uh, uh some information you know about triple g uh, some other you know some insight um you know he knows a lot about the game he knows a lot about the game and, and, and he's a good talker you know he answers questions well which is cool always makes our job easier um but before we go go ahead mike plug our social media once again at the last round 12 on twitter and instagram and join us next week we'll be Reviewing all those Matchroom Square Garden fights from the seventh, and obviously previewing the card we touched on today with uh, Cecilia Brakus against Jessica Muscasco from Tulsa. From Tulsa. So once again, for my co-host Michael Shepard, I'm Danny Z. This is the last round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.